Um, I don't know whether that's how they taught the kids to read or got them to listen to, to what this was about. But uh, reading them, you, you could see the, the pleasure they could take in it. Um, and that, that speech, that thou shalt not steal. This means, of course, that we, we ourselves must not steal. But does it not also mean that we must not suffer anybody else to steal if we can help it? Thou shalt not steal. Does it not also mean thou shalt not suffer thyself or, or anybody else to be stolen from? If it does, then we, all of us, rich and poor alike, are responsible for, this social, for the social crime that produces poverty. Not merely the man who, men, men, who monopolize land, they are not to blame above anyone else. But we who permit them to monopolize land are also parties to the theft. Yeah. So a few days after that, that, New York, that first Anti-Poverty Society meeting, McGlynn came to, to New York to deliver that cross of the New Crusade speech. Uh, and that was at the Philadelphia's Academy of Music. 200 people on the platform. And the reports didn't say how many were in, in there, but, but uh, one 1860 account mentioned that that auditorium, then uh, nearly 3,000 persons, could be emptied in four minutes in great calmness and order owing to the wide corridors and stairways. Okay, uh, I've highlighted Will, uh, Pre President William Atkinson's name here. Does, does that name ring, ring a bell for anyone? D uh, <laughs> my husband would know this. <laughs> Will Atkinson was one of the names I mentioned in the introduction. In 1895, he married Henry George's older daughter, Jenny. She died rather suddenly about seven months before George, leaving a seven-month-old son. Years later, the Schockenbach board knew him as Al Atkinson. We'll, we'll come back, back to Al later, and actually back to some advice that, that, that Hal Atkinson gave, gave to a, a young person to whom he was, with, with whom he was sharing progress in poverty. Um, the Anti-Poverty Society meetings got started in Philadelphia. I have, haven't gone far enough in, in sufficient detail to know exactly how long they went. Uh, but the speakers who had spoken in New York it, it kind of did a circuit, and, and Philadelphia was one of the first places. Uh, McGlynn came over and over again. Uh, and and he, during the um, Delaware single tax period, he, he, he came and spoke frequently and always drew, drew large audiences. Um, another fellow here, that, and I, uh, Thomas Crowsdale, was involved with the standard from the first, and he wrote some excellent long form pieces. He was also a good speaker. He originally, was originally from Southern Delaware and founded a Wilmington newspaper called Every Evening in 1871, oh, the same year that Henry George and a partner started the San Francisco Evening, Daily Evening Post. In the late 1800s, Nor Northern Delaware had four afternoon papers. When every evening and the commercial were merged, it was reported by the News Journal, which is the only paper surviving today, that it would have a, a very large circulation, equal probably by not more than three or four journals south of Philadelphia. When George stepped aside as editor of the Standard, it was Crowsdale who became the editor. He ran for Congress in 1890. He died suddenly at Marywald in August 1891, and Lewis Post would replace him for the final year of the standards publication. Okay, skipping ahead a few years. Uh, those who were in Baltimore last year heard Ed Dodson's talk on Jackson Ralston, uh, 1857 to 1945. At 14, he was setting type to help with family expenses. I don't know how much type there was that had to be set, but have you noticed how many Georgists had, had roles and, and were working with words that way. He was born and died in California, but spent much of his life in Maryland. The son of a judge who died when he was seven, he graduated from Georgetown with a law degree at 19 and practiced law in Quincy, Illinois, then moved to DC where he practiced law for almost 50 years before returning to California, where he then lectured at Stanford Law. His interest in labor law led him to Europe as a union delegate, and he was the, the DC attorney for the AFL, including representing Gompers and others in, in appeals to the Supreme Court uh, in 1911. He earned huge acclaim in international law. Ed described the Hyattsville effort around 19, uh, 1890. In 1892, as president of the Board of Commissioners of Hyattsville in, in Prince George's County, Maryland, he sought to put the single tax into operation. 
1936, he sought to secure by direct legislation the adoption of a single tax amendment in California, contributing $36,000. Back in Maryland, he co-authored a referendum an amendment on single tax. After Hyattsville, we see him next in 1895 as part of the Delaware single tax campaign, aimed at the legislative elections of, of November 1896. He was a member of the Delaware single tax campaign committee and gave a talk in Wilmington in early April of, of, of that year. Oh, I wish I knew how to work this computer. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and this gets gets into the, the formation of that committee. It was really a, nas a national single tax effort uh, focused on Delaware because it was a small state. And of course, we all heard about the efforts to do some things in New Hampshire because it was a small state. Um, but an impressive number range of, of Georgists came through there. <coughs> um, some of these. The, of this list of names, Radcliffe was from Youngstown, Ohio. Sayer was the editor of a Wilmington paper, though I've not figured out which one. George F. Stevens, we know today as Frank Stevens, who was one of the founders of Arden, along with Will Price. Um, and one of the sources said, or actually on, um, on Ed's which website. I'm sorry, say again. Which slide are you on? Uh, yeah, that's where I am. Okay. <laughs> um, and I did have, that left, list on the left is short, because I had one more name in there, and that was Oscar Geiger. And that was based on something that was on Ed's website that mentioned a, a fellow named Henry George Geiser, and this was right after the Geiger listings in the alphabet, um, who, who said that his grandfather had been involved with, with the single tax uh, campaign in Delaware. Well, I can't. I can't decide whether, whether this, that Geyser was a misprint or this was actually Geiger. Oscar Geiger would have been just 21 or so years old at, at the time. So that, that's something to be sorted out. Uh, sometimes the research yields more questions than it does answers. The uh, September 1896 issue of the British Monthly, The Single Tax, article began. The war between the single taxers fighting for free speech and the authorities of Delaware is still raging, and 18 single taxers are now in Dover jail, notwithstanding the threat to put the martyrs to work on the chain gang. Hundreds are waiting their turn to join the prison colony, among whom are James A. Hearn, the famous actor, and, and Dr. C.S. Law, the California mil millionaire. One account said that at any particular time, there might be 50 or 60 people speaking about the single tax. Some meetings were as large as 2,000 people. This is a tiny state. We're still not over a million yet. Before, long before PowerPoint or overhead projectors or Kodak carousels, there were magic lantern slides. Is anybody familiar with those? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, Professor J.C. Frost of Philadelphia had seven lectures, with its own, each with its own collection of 40 to 50 pictures. <coughs> And this was written up in an article in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. So, you know, the word was traveling, um, but he would come into town with, with poster paper and, and write up posters and hang them around uh, to, to, to highlight the, the various lectures he was going to give. The condition of at least two of the Dover prisoners is reported as serious. Samuel Melville is confined to his bed with a fever, and Joseph Gross is not in a much better condition. All of the men show effects of their confinement. They all have the prison power, but with the exception of Melville and Gross, they are all lively and declare they do not regret the course they pursued. The men are pleased with the treatment given them by Sheriff Shaw and appreciate his kindness. The sheriff allows them to sleep in the jail corridor and does not confine them in the cells. For exercise, the men play ball in the corridor. Chairman Stevenson and two others will be out in a week, their terms having then expired. But Drs. Morton and Solis Cohen wrote to the governor as follows, and I'm, I'm abbreviating it, but they were quite explicit about problems. 
prison section of the jail consists of a hall about 48 feet long, 15 feet wide, and 45 feet high, out of which opens doors into 20 cells or compartments, each 8 by 10 feet. 10 on the ground floor, 10 others on a gallery reached by a flight of stairs. It then goes on to describe the water that's dripping from the upstairs to the downstairs. Each cell has an iron grating as well as a close-fitting wooden door. Most of these wooden doors remained open at the time of our visit, but we were informed that it is night, at night it's customary to keep them closed. The only ventilation of the cells themselves consists of a window in each about six inches by 30 inches at a distance of about seven feet from the floor. The number of prisoners confined in the above mentioned quarters on this date, August 8, 1896, was, we're informed, 74, consisting of 73 men and one woman, the latter under detention as a witness. Of this 73 men, a few were serving lengthy sentences, 17 were single taxers, and the others had been committed as tramps for periods varying from 20 to 30 days. How is, how is that for irony? <laughs> Concerning the food, we have little to say. The sheriff does the best that he can on an allowance of 20 cents a day for the entire cost of each prisoner. In our judgment, this jail is in a condition fraught with great danger to the lives of those confined therein. It is possible, if not probable, that the conditions described are if the conditions are described or maintained during the heated term, which is upon us, an epidemic of malignantly contagious fever will break out in it, which may extend to the town and threaten the state. It's not clear that, 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 that he was able to ha they were able to hasten the release, but that but one of those two doctors is the fellow who who bought the Henry George birthplace shortly after uh, George's death. In 1897, a resolution was, was, was introduced in the, in the Constitutional Convention. I have in mind, that, and you can read it there, I have in mind that Mace Gaffney told me years ago that many states, particularly in the South, enacted such provisions during that era. And that was a sign that their ideas were getting out there. Arguably, those measures, such measures are part of what inspired the founding of Fairhope in 1895 and Arden in 1900 as demonstration projects. In both cases, the, the trustees use land rent to pay for the, the, the school and county taxes. In 1897, I'm sorry. You got about four minutes. Okay. Um, well, I'll speak briefly. The, the Vacant Lots Cultivation Association started in, in 1897. Uh, Joe Fells was, was one of the founding members of that and remained on its board for many years. His brother, Samuel, uh, who I think was the one who endowed the planetarium in, in Philadelphia, uh, remained on that board uh, well, well after Joe Fells had died. It may be the only thing the two of them saw eye to eye on, um, and, and I think he, he was, that rift was part of why Fells went off, off to London. Um, let's see. Yeah, no, the, the, Walk, walk through those slides, if you would, please. Um, Fell's name didn't really appear in the papers very much until he made a contribution through the, that vacant lots association to the, a fund for someone who, who had been injured in, in a, an industrial accident. Um, but he supplied the funds uh, to buy land in, in, in Fairhope and then quietly on the side, um, bought up another 2,200 acres that, that he donated. And he also helped, helped get, get Arden started. Um, although some years later, there's a newspaper article saying he wanted $1,000 payment back, you know, that, that hadn't been flowing at the, the speed that, that he had expected. I think it was 1925 that he forgave what was left of Well, he died by then, so. It, oh, maybe it was. Uh, so I think he died in 13 or 14. So, uh, so I don't know. The, I don't know that part of the story. Let me tell you a little bit about Will Atkinson, though. Um, he, he was was Henry George's son-in-law. Jenny died uh, shortly after George died. Henry George Jr. married a woman named Marie Hitch from New Orleans, and she was one of several sisters. Uh, turns out, about three years later, Atkinson remarried to one of her sisters. Um, and so he and, and, and his, well, I'm not even going to try to do the genealogy. <laughs> um, there was a third sister who was married to a remarkable man named Jokichi Takamini, who was a Japanese 
chemist. Uh, and he was the one who discovered adrenaline, uh, now known as epinephrine. He also did some things on fermentation that, that played a major role in industry in Peoria. Well, all these people had homes in, in this community. This was not an enclave, but it was a community of Georgists up in uh, Merriwald in Sullivan County, New York, not too far from Port Jervis. Well, it was far from Port Jervis, 17 miles in those days with a trip. Um, but a, a number of the single taxers in the Manhattan Single Tax Club together uh, got this property. And uh, Atkinson was among them. Uh, and so was this a wonderful Japanese chemist uh, whose wife was a, another of the, the sisters in that family. Okay. Um, yeah. We're out of time, so wrap up. Okay. Catch what's essential. Um, well, actually, the rest of what I had here was, was about some other efforts that were going on at the time. Will Atkinson shortened, made some very short versions of PNP, uh, of POFT, of, of the land question. And I think he only felt free to do that because Anna George broke the ice on abridging. Uh, PNP in 1924. But that's another story, and, and, and maybe there'll be another time for that one. And, any questions about any of this? And if, anybody, if anyone wants source materials, I, I, I've got them, and I'm thrilled to share them. <laughs>